Good morning and good afternoon and for everyone who's joining us all over. I'm Christine Churchill. I'm the founder and CEO of the Customer Service Institute of America. And with me today, I have my very dear friend, uh, Monique Richardson, who I met while I was living in Australia, who has a wildly successful customer service training business and has written two books on customer service. So Monique, welcome. We're so excited to have you here today. Thank you so much, Christine, and a big uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Absolutely thrilled to be here with one of my favorite people in the entire world and fellow customer service passionate advocate in Christine. So wonderful to be here. Oh, thanks, Monique. So I was so excited to see how many people sign up for this webinar today. We are going to be talking about something so important, which is experiential customer experience and moments of truth. So we're going to dive into what experiential customer experience is. Uh, some of you, many of you know what moments of truth are, but we're going to dive into that a little bit further in understanding how that really adds to the customer experience and what it means for your organization to have that as a focus area for not just your frontline team members, but for everybody in your organization. And we'll also finish up talking about, you know, customer loyalty and relationship building and, and what all that means and how you as customer advocates can make such a difference in your organization. So we're really excited about that. So Monique, I would love to hear from you um, about your take on the importance of customer experience or what experiential customer experience means to you. I think the importance of of customer experience is really it like it's it's so critical in any organization and when I think about customer experience I think about it being that whole end to end journey and everything that happens for the customer and I love that definition of customer service is what happens when the customer experience breaks down so when I think about customer experience it really is thinking about how do we design that end-to-end -end journey for the customer so that it can be a really seamless and very easy experience for the customer. And that focus on both how we then deliver that service when our customers do need to reach out to us, but thinking it from that very proactive space about everything. And when we're thinking about customer experience as well, from both the, you know, the frontline delivery, but also looking at everything happens, you know, beside the, you know, the scenes for the customer as well, because there's so much in that design of the customer experience. And that's exactly right. I think when I hear the term experiential customer experience, the experiential piece, I think is, it sounds kind of almost redundant, right? Experiential customer experience. But so many organizations and, and so many team members that I work with are often looking at customer satisfaction ratings mostly, right? And I feel like sometimes we get lost in that trap a little bit because I don't think that most customers come to us wanting to experience satisfaction. They're coming to us because they have a need, like something has driven them there to you, to your business, whether it's a product or a service or something you can do for them, but they already have some kind of emotion tied to what's about to happen. It's either because they know they're gonna spend a certain amount of money, they know that they're doing this for their boss and they have to do it really, really well, or maybe it's a special gift for their family, but they've already got some kind of an emotional tie to what's about to happen. And you and your organization can either really like nail it and drive an amazing customer experience through by thinking about that versus just thinking, am I going to make sure that this person is just satisfied? Like you want them to feel joyful or delighted or relieved or like accomplished. And all those are really kind of the emotions that I think about when people are trying to do business with your organization. I mean, what have, what have you found about mm -hmm. things like that? The emotion part is so significant, you know, how we feel as part of that experience. And you're right, we're going to have those feelings pre, we're going to have it during, and we're also going to have those emotions post. But when we think about what you've just mentioned too, about those emotions that we feel, satisfied, I always think about this one. It's, it's almost like the vanilla, isn't it? Like when we're thinking about satisfied, that's not what's going to drive. Just like loyalty. average. 
It's yeah, yeah, very much average. If I'm satisfied, that's not a strong, you know, emotion. And then when we look at going below that satisfaction, you know, I'm sure for many of us here on our webinar today that we've had experiences that have been less than satisfactory, where we've been made to feel angry and frustrated. So we see where that drives people away from the organisation because as a human being, I don't want to have those feelings again. And if I'm dealing with someone who makes me feel frustrated, angry, upset, I will actively avoid dealing with those organisations. So when we flip it, when I feel delighted or excited or exhilarated because, or even just relief, that is what is going to make me want to go back and deal with those organizations and people again. It's also what makes me refer to my friends and family. So yeah. there was a, a great study that was done actually by an Australian psychologist, <laughs> Dr. Michael Edwardson, that actually was able to link those emotions to what we're going to talk about later with loyalty, that those really strong, positive emotions, it makes sense, doesn't it? It drives loyalty. It drives highest, you know, highest levels of satisfaction. And that's where we can drive that loyalty from the emotions that we create so the emotions become a very powerful part of that customer experience that's right and I think a lot of one of the words that I pulled out that you said was they actively so like that emotions are drives those actions right so and I think that that's something that every organization is so well aware of at this point because when you do have an angry or upset customer I'm sure all of you on here can attest to the fact that they will actively go and tell their story to other people. They want it off their to-do list. So the easiest way to get it to the most people and get it off their to-do list is to just put it on social media somewhere, mm -hmm. right? And so that happens so fast. It's not like this story just kind of, they're thinking about it on the drive home. They want to get it like out and shared. And now it's just too easy. And so that really has become a benefit to some degree for the consumer, but also a little bit of a detriment to organizations because people do have that ability to act so quickly. But on the flip side, I do also see there are a lot of posts with a lot of the kudos, like the little, you know, mm. yeah, great, they did such a good job. But people honestly aren't as apt to do that unless you're really consistently delivering on those things. And I think yeah. that's that's the secret sauce a little bit, right? Because you they might have an amazing experience with you or maybe one of your team members, but if they think that's a one-off, they're not going to put their reputation on the line by talking about what a great experience they had. But if they can see that you're doing this consistently and that everyone across the organization understands that their experience is important then they will share that. So I like that you use that term actively because yeah. I think that's happening a lot more these days. And even just that consistency and, and when it's consistent, mm -hmm. so it can still be consistently amazing rather than that, oh, it's consistently, you know, satisfactory. But when it's consistently, you know, great, but also too, when it is consistently easy and I don't have those issues, that also makes a, a big difference. And when we look at that social media with people or even just being willing to share when things go wrong, there's often stronger emotions when things go wrong. So as well as that I need a resolution, I'm actually feeling so much more emotional and I want to vent, I want to tell everyone about it. So I've jumped on my phone. And even yesterday, I had an awesome experience and I haven't done it yet, but it was wonderful. You know, just a very kind team member that helped my little daughter who cut her finger at the bakery. And I'm meaning to do it, but it's not a stronger emotion. I don't need that resolved. So I know sometimes customers mean to or think to to share that great experience, but it's the consistency that keeps us coming back because I know it's going to be great. And I know I can recommend that business or organization or restaurant to my friends and family because I know that it's going to be great. So the consistency mm. absolutely can. I like what you're saying there too, though, because it's, it, because yes, I think that when people are consistently having good experiences, or even if they have a good one, and maybe they don't go right out and say it on the social, the same way they do necessarily with poor experiences. What they have though, is what I would consider a slow burn. So something that's going to continue that they're going to keep telling that story and keep telling that story and keep sharing it. So it's going to have this lasting effect where, you know, the angry person that's venting, most people can see that. Now I read every review before I buy anything. I'm like, I read the five star and then I read the one star. And a lot of times now I'm able to decipher a little bit better. Okay. This person just had a bad experience and they're a little bitter about it, but 
it, it maybe was a one-off situation. So, but that that consistency, the more that if there's all, you know, 500 five-star reviews and there's like 76 one-star review and they're very specific in what they're upset about, right? So the good news is consumers are also becoming smarter to what they're seeing and what they're reading, I think too. Yeah, for sure. And I think if you're, I'm sure we all do it, everybody on this, you know, call that we we do look at that. If it's accommodation, I don't know about anybody else. I love eating out. Like restaurants are my favorite place in the world. And I'll read those reviews and we look for that consistency so we can see consistently great. And then maybe it's a one-off, but you know what? We're human. So we're also forgiving. But those ones that I see where it's consistently bad, I will actively avoid. Mm -hmm. And what we find that with the consistently great, I always look for the responses as well because mm -hmm. it's often too how that organization responds if it was a one-off and you will see that response even in the review that they have responded to so you know I think you're right like in terms of consumers being a little bit more savvy which I agree like I think initially but I think now we're a little bit more discerning and so we will look at that we will assess that and we will make our judgment based on that Absolutely. Yeah. And I think so kind of the point of talking about the experience part where the emotions are tied in, we really want to bring that we wanted to bring that to the forefront early in this webinar, really, because we know that moments of truth and what we're going to talk about around that is key to triggering those emotions, right? Because every moment that you, that and customer engages with your organization, whether it's with a person or whether it's with your website or whether it's with dialing your phone number or your 800 number, all of those experiences are considered a moment of truth. And so and each one of those isolated moments of truth trigger an emotional reaction that lends itself to telling the customer whether they trust you trust your business if they want to do business with your organization. So yeah, um, so I kind of just high level over moments of truth, but how do you explain you know, moments of truth when you're training at Monique? Yeah, no, great question. Well, I'll always look at moments of truth as any time that a customer has an opportunity to make a judgment about the level of service that they have experienced. So when I look at moments of truth, I think, you know, I, I bought the book many, many years ago called Moments of Truth by Jan Carlson and one of my all-time favourite books. And I think, you know, the best way, I think when we're looking at that and the way that he explained it was even when we're looking at, you know, travelling on an airline and he was the, you know, the, the CEO of the, uh, the airline SAS and they looked at all of those moments of truth and touch points. And you think about those main touch points, you know, when it can be, you know, purchasing our ticket, it could be then when when we're you know, getting on the aeroplane, the greeting, but we think about all of those other touch points or moments of truth that happen within that journey. And it's not just the ones that are those main ones or that involve people, it's all of the other ones. It's our baggage, you know, it's all of those other, you know, touch points that happen. It's when we sit down and then, you know, do we have a, a clean, you know, bag there? I've heard stories of where there's rubbish that's in the bag. That's the moments of, you know, truth. So it's each of those perceptual judgments that we're making along the way. And through those, we will then decide overall then whether or not that has been a positive or a negative experience. And there's some moments of truth that are going to be more important than others. So mm -hmm. I always use the analogy that if we're going out to dinner, you know, the lighting or the music is not going to be as critical usually, depending on, you know, if you're on a first date or something, than the food that is going to be the most you know often the most critical moments of truth so we talk about I often think about it's really great to rate those moments of truth like even on a scale of one to mm -hmm. ten of which of those are, are more significant or important but when we look at you know I think it's great when we look at those moments of truth to actually document those out and that's how customers will make their overall impression is all of those moments of truth and they'll look at each of those and they will then make an overall judgment. Has this been a positive, memorable experience? Has it been sort of somewhere in the in between? There's your satisfaction. Or has this been a really negative experience based on those moments of truth? So, you know, it's really looking at that whole end-to-end -end journey and each of those points that we can make that perceptual judgment. That's right. And sometimes it, it this is where if an organization is siloed, it becomes a real challenge because if the organization is siloed, what ends up happening 
is there might be one section of the business that is providing amazing customer service and then another one that's not. So for example, um, you know, with Comcast, people have either a great stories and a lot of people, and so that's a cable provider here in the US and they also do um, Wi-Fi. And oftentimes people have really poor customer service stories about them. But there's their niche, right? So you've got like the sales group, you've got the team that's going to confirm like an appointment that you have. You have the guy who actually comes out or the girl or the lady actually comes out. You have kind of the follow-up. All of those are run very separately with separate processes and they don't know what the other one's doing. They just know that they said this was going to happen, but they never communicated to the other side. So it's really interesting. I have had some of the absolute best experiences with some companies like Comcast, where uh, they deliver exceptional moments of truth in one piece of it, mm. but not at the beginning or the end, like the middle is terrific. So it's just, it's interesting to think about. You can't just think about your area. Of course, do everything you can that you have control over, but try and invite the other areas of the business and really go through the entire process. Like you're a new customer or the, for that specific like journey that you want to follow for your customer follow it from the very beginning where they're sitting on the couch at home and they're like I need x y and z and then they go to your web they find your website and then how easy is it to understand it to call the number to get a person and I think each of those areas and understanding what the customer goes through is going to inform exactly what areas need some attention yeah and the the siloed experience is never going to be a great one for the customer. So it's really thinking about it from an organizational perspective that when we're looking at that that journey and each of those parts of that, how do we make sure that that is seamless and easy so it just doesn't become clunky or where we've got one area of the business that I know hand on heart that when we're looking at dealing with customer service teams that they are, you know, incredibly customer focused. But if they've got somebody even, for example, in accounts payable or receivable that doesn't have that same level of thinking about their part in the customer journey, we can see how easily it becomes undone to the point where if we don't have everybody thinking that same way about the customer, it feels like that. For the, It feels like I'm dealing with six or seven different companies as compared to one organisation where everybody is talking to each other and we've got that same seamless, easy experience because that's what customers want. They want not you know no friction. They just want it to be easy easy and effortless. They want as minimal pain and frustration. So the siloed one that you mentioned, Christine, that's what creates so much frustration and pain for the customer where it doesn't have to be that way if we think about how do we design that from end to end. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I know a lot of the people listening and that will be watching later, most likely, like I said, customer advocates for the organization, customer service leaders or managers. What if they're at an organization that's not really who just believes the customer service is just the customer service team's job. Now, I don't find that there's a ton of those out there. I'm also blessed with amazing clients, right, that I work <laughs> with. So I get to see some of the best of the best. So I guess there, there are still some that just feel customer service is their job. How, what can they do to try and bring those other departments into the fold or to try to alert their you know, leadership team across the business that this is something that everyone needs to pay attention to. Because I think that's a massive challenge for customer mm. service leaders. Absolutely. And I think it's also where it is a collective leadership across, you know, responsibility across the organization. Mm -hmm. So if we did have, for example, you know, whether it's the head of sales or the head of, you know, marketing or whether or not we do have IT and so on, it's so important that the leaders are driving that mm -hmm. and driving that focus on the customer. However, I also believe in service that we can also be, you know, agents of change. So it can be just about even starting that conversation. And customer service is often the example for the rest of the organization. So I also believe being able to even proactively reach out to then maybe go and have those discussions with those, you know, heads of those areas 
and coming from a place of how can we serve our customer better together Mm -hmm. so it doesn't become a you know this is not happening or this is terrible but having that very proactive focus on what can we do together to make our customers experience easier to make our customers experience you know more you know effective so having I I actually think by just actually organizing those conversations those catch-ups it could be meetings but I do think at that other level we also need to make sure whether it's the you know head of customer service that then gets together with all of those other department heads to be able then to support what needs to happen in the organization yeah Agreed. Yeah. Trying to just start that conversation. And some people, I, I can feel it. I feel it coming through the computer. They're like, well, you don't know some of the other department heads, like they're really clear about this, or they don't feel like this is their area or, you know, whatever it is. So I will recommend to those who do feel that way, like kind of having that conversation starter. Um, the easiest way in, I always feel to the leadership's attention, if that, if you're having trouble getting it is through the bottom line, right? So uh, you can go to serviceinstitute.com. You can download our free financial cost of bad service white paper. This is a lot of good talking points to start with. So if you are wondering, like, how do I get their attention? You can showcase for them how a poor experience, which isn't, you're not talking about your team, your team might be doing great, but the overall experience, if it's poor, this is what it can mean for our bottom line. But if it's good, this is what it can mean for our bottom line. And oftentimes that really helps break the ice a little bit more because it shows that you're thinking about not just the customer experience, because some, believe it or not, don't really worry about that too much. So, but that's not how we are. But what they are worried about is, or or what the stakeholders or um, the stockholders are seeing at the end of every quarter. And if that's their language, then come to them with their language. Yeah. And look, I use that and refer people to it all the time, Christine, about the financial cost of bad service. I love it because if we can build a business case Mm -hmm. and even things like the cost of errors, the cost, you know, to serve, the rework, et cetera, as well as, you know, time taken and so on, that when we can put that as a percentage of revenue and then coming up with some of those proactive solutions, it is absolutely brilliant. If you haven't read it already, I would highly recommend it. It, I, I refer everyone to it, particularly around building that business case, because it's hard to argue with facts and it's hard to argue with data. So if we can come up with that, um, I agree, it makes a big difference. Yeah, yeah. And I think when you're coming to them with things like that, they realize you're really thinking about more than just trying to you know, offload what they believe is your workload or your responsibility to someone else. So no, that's great. Thanks for, for that. Um, so yeah, I think uh, with regard to moments of truth, what do you tell each individual about what their role is in that? Because we can say, oh, well, you know what, we do a great job, but it, it really is. The website needs so much work. Like that's not us. So What do you tell them about the effect that um, their individual moment of truth has? Because I know you were talking about there's kind of like almost a weighting system in the sense that like some moments of truth might be more important than others. I think if we can look at those moments of truth that we directly influence, that's where the most impact has. So if I am the person who is going to be answering, you know, the phone or answering that conversation, or if I am the person that's sending, you know, that email, what's my part in that journey? Because I think it can feel overwhelming to think about that whole experience where there are just literally so many moments of truth. We then multiply that with the amount of customers, with the amount of team members, and just being able to focus on when I'm having that interaction or that moment of truth with that customer, how do I make sure that that is a really positive and memorable moment of truth? We might sometimes be then dealing with a customer that may have a moment of truth that isn't that great. You know what, the website, it was really clunky or this happened. I also believe in the voice of the team. So if we see things that are not working or are frustrating for the customer that we can also, you know, speak up to be able to say these might be some areas that we could improve as well. So it's not like just a, oh, well, that's not my area or my moment of truth. And if that's not great, but I think if we can really focus on the things that we can control, influence and change during those interactions, it also does make an enormous difference. Yeah, and I love that you say that. Well, well first of all, any I always feel that any um, moment of truth that is has a person tied to it, like you're directly interacting with a person at that business, 
that holds more weight than whether they could find a phone number or not, or whether, you know, the first place they left a voicemail, if they called them back or not. I don't know that those experiences weigh as much as when you do have an inner, an individual experience with a person and how much mm-hmm. weight goes along with that. But to your point, they can hear, it might be a frustrated customer. And that's actually gold for a person who is really great at delivering moments of truth because they can actually keep notes. I mean, they are wanting the experience for that customer to be good and they can take notes about some of the pain points that they had along the way. And so many organizations at this point now are really trying to focus on that innovative approach and they're trying to bring all their team members into the fold with that. So it's really a terrific opportunity for those who are trying to change what's happening at the organization so that all the moments of truth are more seamless uh, to take notes of note of that and to like, kind of feed that into the you know continuous improvement model or the innovation model that their business may have. Yeah and highlighting what you mentioned Christine too just about the the power of the the person or that human interaction mm-hmm. and particularly if we do have a look at post pandemic even more so people are happy to do things themselves you know i'm happy to self serve i'm happy to do things online i'm happy to do things digital i'm happy to do way too much shopping online did anyone else do <laughs> one during the pandemic i started to know my delivery driver by name i thought i should probably stop shopping then so we're happy to do things ourselves so often when we are that moment of truth when somebody reaches out to a person it's often because there is an issue or there might be a problem and so that empathy that connection has become even more important than ever before because so many of those simple things we're you know able to do ourselves so I think just highlighting to what you mentioned to the power of that human experience which I see continuing and continuing to have so much more impact because of why we then need to reach out to another person. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it's really that uh, now the super agent, right? I mean, when there is somebody on the other end of the phone, you can imagine that probably 70 to 75% of whoever's calling have tried to self-serve if your organization offers something like that. So they're really calling because there's some kind of issue with the self-serve option or that they have a really more in-depth question. So you know, we can do a whole different webinar on what the super agent looks like now that it's not, there's not as many contact centers that are set up in tiers anymore because they have to know so many different things because Mm -hmm. they don't know who they're getting and most kind of tier one requests people are doing self-serve so no that's a great point yeah so I guess my next thing is taking us into you know the that customer loyalty how all of this builds to that like how how do we get there and I guess The easiest way would be actually just to ask some of our group here too, because I didn't make it clear. If you want to pop anything in the chat or you have any questions, please, please do that because we'd love to hear from you about any of the things that we're talking about and also understanding you as a customer, not just from your business side, but for you as a customer, like what is it that makes you a loyal customer? So if you can take a couple moments and just drop that in the chat, because I'd love to hear that from you. Monique, where are you a loyal customer and why? So I am a loyal customer and I I am one of those people that if I love somewhere, I literally will give you my heart and I will refer you, I will recommend you. So I have a couple of others. I think probably um, a couple of brands that I'm loyal to. Now it's a very special occasion brand, but Tiffany's is one that I'm a very loyal brand to, you know, for those significant, you know, birthdays or events. I do love a little bit of just nice, simple jewelry. So, and then what I found with that is that as my, even my children have got older then that, but it's a, but because of that experience of how you're made to feel when you walk in the door and how they remember you and then the follow-up and the text and, you know, the offer of the bubbles, it, like it's all about that experience. I'm a very, very loyal customer uh, to that brand. I'm also a very loyal customer to my little local Thai restaurant because they have amazing food, amazing service. I've been going there for 20 years. I actually get hugs, you know, when I go in there. That's how long I've been going there and loyal because, again, consistency. I always know that it's going to be great. So when I think about loyalty, there's another, like, 
I do eat a lot of food going out. So a lot of my loyalty does relate to you. Lots of, if you visit Melbourne, everyone, just reach out and I'll tell you where to eat. But I think the loyalty is driven by the experience and how I am consistently made to feel. Mm -hmm. And that's when I look at those, you know, brands or organisations that I have never, ever changed that I am with you because of, again, how I am treated and how, you know, I'm made to feel. What about you, Christine? Have you got any that you're loyal to? Hmm, I do. Um, yeah, actually, I was just thinking of one. And then, yeah, well, so restaurants, same, same. I have one that we go to locally. And it is fun because when we come, like the chef comes out of the kitchen and comes to talk to us. And it seems like people are always like, ooh, the chef is coming out. But it is it is something special. And, and the thing is, is I was going, I want to go back to something you said earlier, though, when we were talking about restaurants and, and moments of truth, and we were talking about how um, the food is like something that you, you want the food to be excellent. And that moment of truth is more important than some of the other ones, like the music or the lighting. But that doesn't make you a loyal customer. What you just explained was that the, what makes you a loyal customer is how they are actually treating you. So you might go somewhere and have a great meal, but that doesn't mean you're necessarily going to go back consistently. It's that personal experience is that that's what shifted you or that's switched you into that loyal customer. And I think that that's, you know, that's the, the same here and the same with, with me, right? Like, so if it, it really depends on the business and how, how they treat you, there's, there's um, a few places we go when we go on vacation. So we tend to vacation in, in one spot and you know where it is, but we tend to stay at the same place because we know the staff. I mean, the team has all been there for, you know, since I've been going and I've been going to the same place for 21 years. And so to know that, to feel like I'm going somewhere that's a second home to me, it makes me not want to deviate. It doesn't really mm. make me want to try a different place to go on vacation right because I know I love it there and Absolutely. our time is valuable and precious right and just picking up too on um what Kelly mentioned in the in the chat there that you know I love it when people remember us at a restaurant or any other business it makes me feel special so can you see again it's that feeling special and also Deb mentioned Amazon bring returns to Whole Foods do everything on your phone they make everything easy so even just the fact that it's so easy I've got one you know store that I've been dealing with for goodness me about you know 12 years it's an online store my mm -hmm. elder son barracks for the Chelsea Football Club and so he went through a stage where that was all he would wear he would just dress up like a footballer and so I've never met them but the whole experience has it's all digital it's all online but it has been so seamless and so easy so I think loyalty can also be driven um, exactly as Deb said by that ease of experience as well but that feeling we have that's what often drives loyalty because mm -hmm. we get xyz but how am I made to feel and if I'm made to feel look back to what you mentioned at the start those positive emotions then that's one of the key things that drives loyalty proven yeah yeah Amazon is an interesting one because it is it tends to be that ease part and I've had two experiences recently where um, something didn't go, you know, usually you order it, you know, when it's coming, they tell you, you can see it's on the way, you know, exactly where it's dropped. Your ring door bell tells you that it's here. Right. So last night I had something that was delivered at nine 30. It was never delivered and it doesn't panic me because it's Amazon. Right. I know that mm -hmm. I can go right to my order, get on a chat with someone, explain what happened and they will just, you know, credit my account back. So they make that part easy too. Mm. And there's not that knowing that something's easy starts to eliminate that stress that a lot of us don't need. I mean, we certainly carry enough of it around from so many other things we do. Why would mm. we invite that in with a place that we're going to spend our hard earned money? Yeah. And even when those things do happen and do go wrong, I always think that is also another really critical moment of truth because as much as we try to, things can happen. So when things do go wrong or for all of us in, you know, our own, you know, businesses where something happened that should have never happened in the first place, that how we recover from that moment of truth and the service recovery that we put around that can again be another opportunity to be able to strengthen loyalty 
if it is actually handled really well. So I think there also has to be given thought into when things don't go well, how do we actually make that a really positive experience for our customers? It is like you read my mind because this is <laughs> always the point where when I when I am doing training and we are talking about moments of truth and then it, it inevitably, inevitably leads to talking about, you know, customer relationships and customer loyalty. I always say, you, you know, there are people who are fairly loyal right? They might come back to you. Maybe it's your restaurant, but no, I don't think people are like so loyal until something actually does go wrong. Right. I mean, it's kind of like in a relationship when something goes wrong in your relationship, when maybe you just start dating someone or a friend that, that, kerfuffle that you have with that person is going to either grow your relationship closer or it's going to drive you further apart. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what these service recovery moments are, right? It's either going to pull that customer closer into the fold with regard to their loyalty and how they're going to speak about you and your organization, or it's going to drive them further away. So I love that you bring up service recovery because that is often a place where a lot of businesses know they need to address it, but they don't take it on. They they think that they've already lost that customer. They're like, let's just mm -hmm. get through it. This person's obviously not coming back. So let's just like get through it as best we can. But that I, I find that that's actually not the case. And often a really missed opportunity because, Absolutely. you know, if we think about that, you know, and, and where I love what you also mentioned with that, you know, with thinking about the relationship, it's also about the deposits. Mm -hmm. So if you think about that with a deposit, like I'm about to celebrate 25 years of marriage. So, you know, there's those times when, you know, thank you. Sounds like you need a trip. I have a great place to recommend. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and so you go, you know, lots of deposits. So, you know, if, you know, he does leave the dishes and hasn't done them, can you say, okay, that's not great, but that's just, that's a one-off. What happens from the business perspective is that when we've got loyal customers, the great thing is that if something does happen that should have never happened in the first place, with loyalty comes forgiveness. Yes. So I had a demonstrated relationship with this organization and you know what, it was a one-off. So you know what, I, I know I can, if it's recovered well, they will usually be more understanding. And unless it becomes a pattern of behaviour, mm -hmm. where it then starts happening all the time, all the time, all the time, just like any relationship or friendship, you'll end up fed up and you will, you know, do something about that. Where it happens, though, that I've got no relationship and no loyalty with that company it's or organisation, it's the first time that I've dealt with you and something goes wrong, can you see there? There's no relationship that there's been no deposits. Bad so we first often, thing. correct. We don't need to That's call them back. Bad <laughs> lighting. And so right. then we would often see that there is then, you know what, if we don't handle that well, it, it's harder because there's no, I'm not saying it can't be done, but it is definitely harder. But you know what? If it's been a bad experience and you don't recover from that well, why would I ever come back again? Because I've got no trust, I've got no loyalty, there's no relationship. But if it is handled well, it might be enough for that customer to say, you know what, I'm going to give them another go. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you, those service recovery moments in the context um, is, is really, really important. Yeah. Love that one too, Deb, thinking about those interactions as gifts. Many times you learn something that you can correct and make a very strong advocate that will help refer you to others. Absolutely. One of my favourite books, The Complaint is a Gift by Janelle mm -hmm. Barlow. It's a great reminder that when things go wrong, it is a real, that moment of truth is a gift. Yes. Yeah, hundred percent. And I, I think that this is We've kind of talked about how customer experience is everyone's job. We've talked about moments of truth and the importance of those personal moments of truth. We've talked about, you know, how we drive customer loyalty and the importance of service recovery. So, you know, we have a range of people listening now and that are also going to be watching this. So I would say um, my first question would be if people are just kind of starting to think about this, that you know, customers are experiencing emotions as they're, they're interacting with you. And that's something to think about. And the moments of truth piece, where would someone start? Like, in your opinion, where, where is, is the individual who's watching this going? I know we need a lot of help at our company. Like, where would you recommend they start? 
the first place I always recommend to start is looking at ourselves because I think that we change and influence things through ourselves and mm -hmm. every single person who is on this you know call today or listening to this call I think thinking about our personal impact and the ripple of that mm -hmm. so I always like to think about that with those moments of truth asking myself that question how do I want that person or that customer to feel yes after that interaction and I think that's a really powerful one you know I I read I was talking to a, a team member we were you know reading through some ideas around that and one of the things that she mentioned I've never forgotten she said I ask myself at the start of every day would I like to be served by me today and I thought that was really, really powerful, you know, to think about that. So I, I love that thought about with those moments of truth, how do I want someone to feel after they've had that interaction, you know, or moments of truth with me? I think then thinking about it at a team level, I think this is a great one that you can also even getting the team together and say, let's talk about all of our moments of truth that customers mm -hmm. experience within our team. I love then just getting there as an activity, just documenting each of those going through what that actually looks like and then going and rating them and each of those moments of truth and a level of importance. So on a scale of one to 10, how important is this to our customer? Back to the food example, food, 10 out of 10, wine list, 10 out of 10. Um, it could be then the, you know, the cutlery, five out of 10. So as an example, so then you rate the importance. Then I recommend then saying, how well are we performing each of those moments of truth. So we'd rate the food, you know, we'd rate the cutlery, et cetera. And what we're looking for then is a moments of truth gap. So what we then look at is if I've got something that's a moment of truth as a nine or 10, and we're doing that at a four or five, what's the gap and what is the solution for how we can improve that moment of truth? We then come up with some improvements. We then create some actions and we look at how do we then focus on that within our team. It's a great activity that you can do within a team environment, but I'm also about reflection. But then let's look at what actions that we can take to improve that. Mm -hmm. And then from that conversation, you can then even start having those wider conversations with other areas, you know, within the business and saying, look, this is something that we've just done. Would love to talk now about how our moments of truth connect with yours. And how can we improve that experience between our two areas and then just letting it flow on from there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I love that idea. I love taking the, the concept of taking this and working on it with your team and with, with your work colleagues, because I think it's really eye-opening to understand all the, all the things that we're taking in as customers all the time about you and about your business. And like you were saying, even something like the cutlery, right? This is not something we consciously, con consciously think of, but it's something that we, it, it is programming in your head, you, the experience that you're having to some degree as you're going and rating those. I think that's brilliant. Um, so we are at about, you know, quarter of, so I, a couple of things I wanted to Tell people, please, please, if you have questions or comments, just go ahead and pop them in the Q&A so Monique and I can address those. Um, and then let's see. Oh, so yes. What you mm -hmm. said, to, yeah, Terry was wondering if you could repeat that. I loved that too. Sure. Absolutely, Terry. So my question is, you know, how do I want someone to feel at the end of that interaction with me? And the other question that one of the team members shared with me when we were talking about this was how would it feel to be served by me today? Mm -hmm. That was the other key question. So I hope that's answered that. Let me know, Terry, if you need anything else. But I think they're two, you know, really, really powerful questions that we can ask ourselves every day. Yeah, I love that. I love trying to put, because automatically by asking that question of, you know, how would being, how would it be to be serviced by, served by me today? It automatically puts you in your customer's shoes thinking that way initially. So yeah, I think that that's brilliant. Uh, and Monique, I know people would be very interested in learning about the books that you have as well while we're talking about this, because I know each of your books directly and, and indirectly in some ways discuss exactly what we're talking about here. So do you want to talk a little bit about your books that you have? 
Sure. So my first book that I wrote is called Managing Difficult Customer Behaviour, A Practical Guide for Confident Conversations. And I wrote that one during the pandemic when I saw how poorly our customer service community was being treated. And it was really a, a book that I wrote so that we could then look at how can we support our community. So it's just here. You can see, I think I've got my little blur there. Um, and that one is available on my website as a free PDF. So I have made that one available for everybody because I want to make sure that everyone's got access to that one. So that one is a free PDF. My second book, which is just um, not very far away, hopefully about four weeks away from being released, is called They Serve Like We Lead, How to Take Care of Your People So They Take Care of Your Customers. And this is a book for anybody who is in a leadership position, whether it's a team leader, leader, manager, to look at all of the practical ways that we can take care of our people so that they can deliver a great experience to the customer. So as well as moments of truth, then there's a lot of employee moments of truth and how do we make sure that we're taking care of our teams at each stage of those. So that is hopefully about a month. We've uh, just got the second edit done. So it's all very exciting and not very far away. And you've written that more as a practical guide too, right? Where people can actually use that, not like read it and then try and figure it out. It's is actually something they can use as a tool in their business. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm all about the practical and the how. So the same thing with the difficult behavior, you know, how do we de-escalate that conversation? And the service leadership book is the same. It's how, and you know, I'm all about my actions. So even at the end of each chapter, it's the, here's the actions I'm going to take and some recommended tips for being able to put that into, into play. So it's a real doing book. Uh, they both are. So yeah, so that's uh, very exciting with book three in the pipeline as well. Oh, this gosh, away. that's new information even for me. Uh, the Managing the Difficult Customer Behavior. Tell everyone your website so they can go there and get it. Sure. It's just www Monique Richardson. Sorry, www.moniquerichardson.com.au. Yes. Okay. So Monique Richardson always. Oh, right, isn't it? Because you, you just don't do your own website, do you? www.moniquerichardson.com.au. <laughs> that's it. That is it. <laughs> That is it. I can attest to that. Um, oh, thank you, Bob. Yes. Um, so Bob said that, yes, the moment of truth exercise is so valuable. And I think people actually really enjoy it when they start working through it and thinking about it. They start to think about what they do in a day and the business in a whole new way. Absolutely. And I just find doing that one as a team, like it's just such a great team activity. If you've got a whiteboard or you've got a, you know, butcher's activity, I've done it online as well. It's an awesome one to be able to get all the team involved. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. With so many people with hybrid workplaces now, there's, there's great ways to be able to do that still within the virtual world with some of the whiteboard and et cetera. So um, other questions as Monique and I are, are beginning to wrap up questions or comments. Well, Monique, I do have to say today was such a pleasure. So much fun for me. I just enjoyed it. I mean, when do I not enjoy my time with you? I always do. So, <laughs> but it's always great. You contrib contributed hugely valuable information to everybody here. And also for any of you who are interested, uh, one, we will be sending the recording out in case you had any team members that you would want to have see this, or you'd like to share that with. And additionally, we will let you know when Monique's second book is available here in the next few weeks, which would be so if you're interested, you know, obviously you can order one at that time as well. Fantastic. And I just want to say thank you to uh, everybody here today and a big thank you to you, Christine. It was a, a number of years ago that we met, but when I met Christine, and I'm sure you can all attest to this, just your heart and your passion for service. And I know that we had that connection from the very, very first time that we met. So it's been an absolute privilege and honour to be here with you today. Someone I deeply respect and admire in the world of service that just continues to passionately work to make a difference in the world. So a big thank you to you. Thank you, Monique. I mean, 
Same to you. Honestly, I will tell you when I started working with Monique and we would do training, there was a point where I would be like, I'm not, I'm not training on the same day as Monique and I have to go first. She cannot go in front of me because I never want to follow her because her personality and her ability to engage team member or uh, participants and make them laugh. I just was like, oh, that's just, I can't do it. So I absolutely love working with you and you yeah, I'm just thrilled that you're doing this because every day I know you make such a difference. And let's see, do you have a couple of, yes, Deb, thank you, the new book. And Gina, thank you. We appreciate that. So, all right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, it was such a pleasure, Monique. I do hope we get to do something again together soon. Absolutely. And we will love to. You. What's that? I said I would love to. And thank you everyone for being here. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all for your time. And I hope you found it interesting and valuable. And until next time, we'll see you later. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.